the paintbrush swept the last of the sand away from the small burnished coin. Mary sat back with a sigh and rubbed the feeling back into her right thigh. It was cold. Not the cold of winter, but the cold of stone twenty feet beneath the earth. The kind that seeped through your bones from sitting too long. Although she had tied her hair with the blue ribbon her mum had brought her one Christmas, parts still managed to slip out to obscure her eyes. It had been the same for the last three years. The constant searching. The ache and cold from sitting too long in one spot. All because of the Lady of All Hollows. What had begun as an excavation for Roman artifacts soon turned into a more pressing mystery. Ever since Mary and her team had found the Lady behind the wall, they had scraped away the site around her, trying to find clues as to why she was there. Now there was only the stone covered, the lady, and a sheet of glass. Mary looked up at the light-colored face behind the airtight glass. The lady was beautifully pale in the baleful light of the crypt. The yellow hue cast upon her face highlighted her cheekbones in perfect slants. Although the light did little for her skin tone or even to penetrate the black of her tightly wound bun, it still made her face stand out amongst the darkness. If Mary was honest, she imagined she would look just as pale in the circumstances. Or maybe she did. But she was never as beautiful. Plus, she didn't see the light of day very much anymore, working in the crypt below All Hollows Church. Even if she wore the same dark gothic dress the lady wore, she'd still feel inadequate in comparison to her beauty. Still nothing, ally, she whispered. She had dubbed her ally as it was the only name she could think of that was close to All Hollows. It seemed stupid, but calling her the Lady of All Hollows felt outlandish. Mary tucked the loose hair over an ear and sighed again. Why are you even here? Just tell me. A head of bouncing black dreadlocks poked out from around a stone alcove. I hate it when you do that. What? Mary asked with mock surprise. You talk to her like she's real. It's creepy. Oh, come on, Tess. She was real once, you know, Mary said, shuffling around to face her colleague. Still, it's creepy, Tess said, pulling on her coat. She's creepy. No, she's not, Mary said, exasperated. She's beautiful. Mysterious, and elegant, and creepy, Mary sighed again. Three years, Mary. Three years and all we have is some cryptic message about a girl who doesn't exist anywhere in history. And the lady herself. Tess shuddered and tied the coat band around her waistline. She waved a hand vaguely over to the newly hanging segment of an old wooden door. A part of the door that had once holed Ally in her eternal resting place. What had been thought of as a small mystery as to why someone would brick up a doorway soon turned into quite a shock when, through a broken section, Ally's face could be seen. When Mary and her team painstakingly removed the door, the message on the other side caused quite a stir. One broken word amidst a score of scratches had caused Mary two years of extra after-hours studies. She buried herself in any historical document from the era, trying to find out just who the name was. But every attempt had come up short, lacking. Have you thought more about what we talked about yesterday? We don't need his funding tests. We can get by. Get by. Is that what you call this? Tess waved an arm around the crypt. Tower Hamlet's council wants their site back. If we can't find funding soon, they're going to take this all away. Mary let her head fall into her hands. I know, I know, but I just don't... Like him? You don't have to like him, Mary. He's not Carl. She tensed at the mention of her ex-boyfriend's name. But we do need his money. That's why I called him this morning. You did what? Her voice sounded larger than it was in the small confines, and the echo bounced back to them quickly. Tess let it die before she carried on. We need this, Mary. Not just for you, but for me too. This is our project, remember? Your name might be first on the papers, but I'm a co-author here. Can't we just wait and see if the museum board... No, Mary. They didn't listen last time and they're not going to listen now. You know I'm right. Listen to his pitch, it's a good one. Trust me. 
For once. Trust me. I do trust you, Tess. You know that. Tess smiled, adjusted the handbag strap over her shoulder, and pressed down her coat. He'll be here soon. Mary's eyes went wide for a second at the thought of being left alone in the crypt with the man. Don't worry. There are cameras all over the place down here, Mary. You know that. You'll be fine. And plus, Mr. Clairval is a gentleman. A handsome gentleman, Tess added with a wink. Love you. Good night, Mary said, turning back to her tools. Love you too. Don't stay down here too long, girl. Go out for once. At least see the city. Good night, Mary replied with a smile. Silence reigned in for a moment as Mary listened to Tess ascending the stone stairs. The echoes of her footsteps sounded like a latent door slamming in a deep cave underground. She sat for a while, lost in thought. It was true. They needed the money. And Mr. Clairval's offer would allow them an additional five years of funding. But she didn't want to be held captive by anyone, let alone a man whose whole business model was the exploitation of tourism. Her phone buzzed in her pocket and she pulled it out. The message flashed in the dim light. She read it once, sucked her lip, and pocketed the phone again. She looked up at the lady again and blanched. I'll call her back later. The echo of her voice grew quiet. Look, I don't want to talk to a new therapist about him, all right? It's hard enough remembering all the things he did to me. If I talk about it again... She left the sentence hanging and shook her head then slowly began to replace her tools in the slots of her canvas bag. All right, Jesus, I'll talk to her. What is it with you people and my problems? She grumbled. When the last of her tools were secured, she pulled her legs out from under her, twisted to the left, and collected her prosthetic leg resting against the wall and reattached it. She stood slowly, then turned on the spot and placed the tool bag by the open book on the makeshift pedestal that had become her desk. The alcove was one of the larger ones in the slim corridor of the crypt. Fifty feet in length and only two to three meters at its widest, and the same tall. The crypt didn't just make you feel claustrophobic. It made you know you were feeling it. For Mary, it had turned into more of a warren. A place where she could hide from the outside world and the evil people in it. She sat on a stool and started to write where she had left off. She scribbled until an ache started in her neck. Mary rolled her head to ease it away. It's not that bad, is it? Mary's eyes flashed open to the man leaning against the wall. She hadn't heard his footfall through the noise in her head. Mr. Clairvel, I wasn't expecting you until... She glanced at her watch and was surprised to find that she'd been writing for over an hour. That's quite all right, Miss Goodwin. I'm just excited to see your exhibition. To be honest, I have heard all about you and the Lady for All Hollows. He gestured to Ally. She is quite the story, she said, pushing up off her seat. She is quite remarkable. She is. They stood in a shared, odd silence for a moment, until Mr. Clerval walked over to the glass. How someone could do such a thing is unimaginable to me. He stroked the glass as his eyes sparkled. I'm afraid we still don't know much about her. Mr. Clerval turned sharply and held out a small, tarnished red book. I do. Mary looked down at the book and then back at the man. Then snatched the book from his hands. I'm sorry, she said meekly. His green eyes flashed under a thatch of auburn hair, and his smile, although lopsided, held a dimple. Tess was right, she thought. He was handsome, in a way. W what do you mean, you do? She asked, opening the book. When I called you last month, it was because I found something, Miss Goodwin. Mary, please, call me Mary. Mary? That smile again, she thought. Last year, I attended an estate sale in Berkshire. Lord Ainsley the Third had died without an heir, and... I, for one, could not bear to see his vast collection of manuscripts split up and scattered to the four corners of the world, so I bought them all. This was in his collection. When I read it, I instantly remembered reading about you and your amazing find in the papers. Elizabeth Beaufort. We were totally wrong, Mary gasped. 
The letters were scratched away. They're not spaces like I thought. Mary gasped again. You see? I knew how much this would mean to you. And I also knew how good of an opportunity this would be for the church and the history of our founding fathers. What is it you want, Mr. Clerval? Mary said slowly, taking the man in before her. Please, call me James. Okay, James, Mary said, pulling the hair back over her ear. She couldn't stop looking into his eyes. It wasn't that she fancied him. Well, not much, but something in them made her feel like she had met him before. I want to recreate an experience using your data and mine. And I wanted to center around Elizabeth. What sort of experience? This journal contains the accounts of a Halloween event held here in 1857 by my ancestor, Baron Henry Clerval. What I want to do is recreate the event so tourists can see how the Victorians celebrated Halloween and learn about how the Lady of All Hollow spent her last night here. Wait, Mary flipped through that book scanning hard to find any words that suggest how she came to be holed up. If you're looking for how Elizabeth came to be down here, you won't find it in there. I've checked extensively. What the journal will give us is the adventure for the VR program. My team has already built it and delivered a... He scanned around for the right word. Projected version of events. And you need me for... Because you were the one that found her. And I would very much like you to be at the All Hollows Halloween Gala. A gala? Yes. I've already taken the necessary steps with the deacon of the parish and the board of tourism. But I wanted you to agree as well. As a formality. My work is a formality now? Please, I didn't mean it like that. Mary gestured to the book, but turned again as a hand laid on her arm. She stiffened and pulled back. Mr. Clerval lifted his hand and smiled apologetically. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to offend you, please. My offer is more than generous and will help you carry on your good work for some time. However, your notes would be a great help for the experience. Mary sucked at her lip again. She looked at the book in her hand and all the questions it would answer. She flicked through the pages, deep in thought. As she scoped a third of the book, the pages stopped. What should have been another forty leaves of paper was a stub of torn ends. Where are the rest? Ah, I'm afraid that's all there was. Mr. Clerval turned away and studied the lady behind the glass. I do hope what is there can shed some light on any questions you have. Mary closed the book and regarded the man. Something was telling her that he couldn't be trusted. His voice, although honey and promises sounded very much like the board of directors at the museum. Then Tessa's voice sounded in her head, telling her that after her attack she hadn't trusted any man ever since. When is this gala? Halloween night. Can you imagine it? Halloween at All Hollows Church. I don't think there could be anything as fitting. How is it all going to fit? I mean, I've seen those things on television. They're so chunky and take up so much space. Mary gestured to their surroundings, or lack of. Ah, well, that's the beauty of technology, Mr. Clerval said, reaching inside his pocket. A smooth black box came out. It was the size of a glasses case, with the snaps to close and pivot hinges. All we need is this and a few other things down here, mostly cameras. The VR nodes will allow the user to immerse in the program while those upstairs will be able to watch on a large screen. Here, have a look. Mary took the box and opened the snap lid. Inside were five small white pads and a slim set of translucent glasses. We hook up the pads here. Mr. Clerval reached out towards Mary and she shied back. I won't hurt you, he said, resting a finger on the side of her temple. A small buzz of uncertainty raced through her. One here... He moved to the other side. Her breath hitched up. One here? She felt a flush of warmth course up her neck, mixed with a tinge of fright. And one behind each ear. Then the glasses will do the rest. 
She pulled back and looked down. Mary took out the glasses and put them on, her mind a commotion. I don't get it, she said, looking around, shaking off the conflicting feelings of fight and flight. I can't see anything. You would if they were on. If you'd like to experience it, it would only take me a minute to upload your notes. The computer back at my headquarters will do the rest. Mary nodded shyly. There was something fascinating about technology nowadays, she thought. And sure, she had a smartphone. Who didn't? But virtual reality was still something considered in the realms of science fiction. Is this it? He said, motioning to the book on her desk. She nodded and stowed away the glasses. He picked up the book and angled his phone. He flipped through the pages rapidly while his phone hovered over it. What are you doing? I have an app that allows me to interlink with the hub at my office. The app can read text within a few microseconds, and then sends it back to the Omniputer. Mary watched as her note was consumed within minutes. The quick finality of it made her sick to her stomach. Now, I believe, Mr. Clerval said, flicking through his phone, that we are set up and ready. If you want to sit down, it will make the experience more comfortable. We will have a VR chair delivered for the real experience, but if you stay still, it should feel just as real. I'll feel it, like, for real? she asked, sitting down on her stool as Mr. Clerval attached the pads. Yes, the Omniputer has sight, smell, taste, sound, and texture parameters. You will not only see what is happening, but will feel it as well. There will be a small consciousness blip as you download with the program. Nothing to be concerned by he added, seeing Mary's face. After that, a second of dizziness from the integration. And then the magic begins. Mary chewed her lip nervously. And if I wanted to stop? Easy, Mr. Clerval said, reaching for her hand. Just pinch the skin between your thumb and forefinger on your left hand, and the system will disengage. Are you ready? Mary took a deep breath as she thought about learning all about the lady behind that wall. Elizabeth. Okay, I'm ready. Mary placed the glasses over her eyes and was surprised at the darkness. Gingerly, she lifted them again. It's okay, relax. You're going to enjoy this. The darkness diffused in a swirl of ink dots. The black crept away to the edges and dull points of yellow light swam past slowly. Mary breathed deeply, as the gentle motion of travel vibrated up her legs, which she thought was weird as one of them was missing. She was warm and comfortable on a padded bench. The sounds of the street and the slow clop of hooves filled the carriage. Elizabeth! Mary turned sharply at the voice and her world shifted. Opposite her, on an equally comfortable seat, sat a lady of mid-age. Her blonde hair was tied up in an elegant bun, and around her neck sat a necklace of diamonds. Mary found her hand going to her hair, to find it pulled up tightly in a similar bun. But about her neck wasn't a string of jewelry. Instead, her dress ended in a high neckline. Elizabeth? I'm speaking to you. At least have the decency to converse with me. God only knows you'll need to speak to others here if you're to find a husband. A husband? Mary forced the words past a harshness in her throat. Her hand went up again and pulled at the neckline of her dress. She felt the compression of something more than the dress at her throat, like a bandage hidden underneath. Yes, my dear, a husband. I don't need to tell you that you were getting beyond the normal age. You're older now than Lady Dempsey's daughter, Violet, when she was married. Poor girl. Now leave your neck alone. If you keep pulling at it, everyone will know. No, what? Mary swallowed. The lady in front of her cast her eyes away. For a second, Mary felt embarrassed. Then a burning sensation, coupled with the feeling of swollen glands, pulled it away. Where are we? Mary croaked. Lady Beaufort clicked her tongue and turned to the window of the horse-drawn carriage. She pulled at the side of her hair and spoke out of the corner of her mouth. You know full well where we are going. I will not have another bout of conflict with you on this. I've heard Lord Ainsley's son Thomas will be there. He's a fine gentleman, Elizabeth. You will do well to impress him. God knows we could use the money after your father. 
She left the sentence hanging with an air of disgust. Well, we won't talk about that. Lady Beaufort glanced at Mary's neck, then her gaze slipped away. The gala, Mary hissed. For a moment, she had forgotten this wasn't real. That she was inside a VR program. Inside, another human soul that once walked the earth and was holed up a few feet from where her real body sat in the crypt. Yes, the gala. Baron Clerval has gone to extraordinary lengths. Throw this most lavish gala that London has ever seen. It's your last chance, Elizabeth. I don't need to impress on you how important this is. As the words left her mouth, Mary spied out the carriage window. The night hugged the infamous Tower of London. The grey stones blended with the blackened sky around it. The colossal walls that ran around the tower felt ominous and oppressive, until the torches of all hollows burnt the image away. The steps were abuzz with people entering the church. Ladies pulled up the hems of their dresses to climb the steps, while their gentlemen or chaperones offered arms to aid their ascent. The carriage rocked to a stop. Here we are, Lady Beaufort said quickly, while smoothing down her dress. She pulled at the fabric of Mary's dress and then stopped, cradling her chin in her hands. You are not to tell anyone about Victor. If they ask, he is still exploring the Arctic. We don't want a scandal. Do you understand? Mary felt the heat from the lady's hands, although her skin stayed cold. While her brain raced to remember everything she had read in the journal, she nodded. Yes, ma'am. Lady Beaufort shook her head and pulled her hands away. Ma'am. I may not have pushed you out, but I am your mother, and I won't hear otherwise. The carriage door opened, and the smell of salt water and smoke circled inside. Lady Beaufort took the offered hand of the carriage driver and stepped down. Milady, The carriage driver reverted his eyes as he offered Mary his hand. For a second, fear crept in around her chest. Then she grasped the rail and stepped down to the cobbled road unaided. They stood for a minute as more of London's elite roamed the church's steps, and then Lady Beaufort grabbed Mary around the arm and pulled her towards the steps. Now remember to be polite in your conversation. Don't let the other ladies see your weaknesses. Men like a strong lady, Elizabeth, not a forceful one. Even if they don't know, they need it. Do they like quiet ladies? I don't think I can talk that much with this around my neck. Mary reached up again and felt the slap of a hand. Don't you touch that. Leave it where it is. If anyone sees your scars... Lady Beaufort reached the top step and smiled as a man in an overly tall top hat and black eye mask bowed. Baron Clerval, how gracious of you to welcome us to your party. Lady Beaufort, Miss Elizabeth, it is an honor that you accepted my invitation. I wasn't sure you would attend after Victor and myself. Well, it isn't the time for that. Please, go inside and enjoy yourself. The ladies are in the annex off to the right. Drinks, well, I know you will find them. He bowed stiffly, and Lady Before, with a pursed lip at the insult, swept Mary forward. They stepped under the stone arch of the church's entry. How dare he? He knew I couldn't refuse his invitation. The heavy wooden doors were pulled back and hidden behind spindly trees planted in pots. Cut-out bats and other Halloween decorations littered the dark recesses. Who does he think he is? said Lady Beaufort. If he was going through what I am, he would drown in... She forced her mouth closed. Mary saw the bulge of muscles at her cheek and wondered just what she was holding back. Soft music greeted them as they entered the main church area. High up in the eaves, a band played. Below them, over the grand granite floor, ladies and gentlemen swept around to the tunes. All around, people conversed. Remember what I told you, Elizabeth. Lady Ramkin's daughters are not to be toiled with. I know you haven't met them before, so I will forego you the experience. Martha, the one there in the pink gown and devilish mask, she's betrothed to Lord James Grantham. A fine gentleman. Her sister, Hannah, she's the one to watch. Rumor is that she was James' first choice, but her father saw fit to offer Martha's hand instead. Hannah is bitter about the whole affair. Mary looked across the room at four girls in dresses finer than the one she wore. Each held a mask over their eyes of different creatures. She wondered why they bothered, as it did little to conceal anything about their face. Then she remembered it was a Halloween event. Panic set in as she realized she didn't have a mask. 
we don't have a mask? Aren't we supposed to be in fancy dress? Aren't? Are we not, Elizabeth? She shook her head. You spend too much time around the stable, boy. And no, I don't succumb to the need to conceal oneself. It's, well, it's just plain stupid. Mary bowed her head and apologized. Where was I? Ah, yes, Beatrice Hamley. She's another one to watch. The girl with the black hair and beauty spot under her lip. You see her? Mary glanced over. Beatrice didn't bother putting the mask up all the way over her eyes. Those were glued to a young man, talking to an older gentleman in a blue navy uniform across the dance floor. Who's the boy she's looking at? Mary asked. He was handsome and appealing. He bore a striking resemblance to Carl. It was how he held himself. Straight, tall, confidence. And then he looked over and smiled. Mary felt her cheeks blush. Something passed between them. An unspoken acknowledgement that she felt rather than read. Elizabeth knew him. And by knowing him, it was more than formally. Her soul stirred. This was someone who didn't hurt women, but cared for them unequivocally. Who? Lady Beaufort followed her glance. Oh, that's Master Henry Tolgrath. I've heard he's grounded now, something about... No, not him, the man he's with. Lady Before laughed. Mary turned away from the gent, surprised at the sound. Oh, you still do know how to make me giggle. I'm sure Harry has been waiting to see you all night. Harry? Mary flushed again as the young man looked over. Really, Elizabeth, if you're going to act coy around Harry Ainsley, then you might as well let Beatrice have him. That's Lord Ainsley's son? Mary bit her lip, or Elizabeth did. She wasn't so sure where she began and Elizabeth ended. The environment was so real. The people were tangible. Lady Beaufort so warm and sturdy. Of course, you silly girl. She lowered her voice. Are you experiencing forgetfulness again? Are the bandages too tight? Mary felt a lump at her throat, but she pushed away the feeling. No, I'm fine. I just... I, I forgot how handsome Harry was. She fainted, trying to find a lie that would fit. He was handsome, she thought, and Elizabeth obviously loved him. But how had she come to be behind the wall when there wasn't any apparent danger? Oh, I see Marcus Bradbury is talking to the commissioner about your father's expedition. Uh, Elizabeth, go and mingle. I need to stop whatever he's going to tell him for your father's sake. All at once, Mary was alone in a sea of unfamiliar people, in an unfamiliar time. She wandered a little brushing past people in detailed animal masks. Each one held to the custom of Halloween. Bats, cats, witches, goblins, demons. So many flashed past, but each one held Mary's eyes for a lingering moment before pressing on. It was like they all had the same question burning in their minds. Why was she here? A question that was the only reason why she allowed herself to use the VR system. Elizabeth? We didn't think you'd be attending, you know? The girl pulled her finger across her throat as her tongue poked out. Mary tried hard to remember which one Lady Before had warned her about. Beatrice, right? Mary couldn't help the sarcasm entering her voice. The disdain the girl in front of her held was palpable. I'm sorry, Mary continued, as a small shudder of nerves and anger crept into her voice. You all look alike. Beatrice scoffed. And I see you're not partaking in the festivities at all. Was that your mother's dress? The girl behind Beatrice sniggered. There was a feeling surfacing in Mary. Although she couldn't tell if it was her, or the connection she felt to Elizabeth, or the VR program. Before Mary opened her mouth to retaliate, Beatrice grabbed her by the arm and whirled her around. Let's not fight tonight, Elizabeth. I know you've had a rough time lately. Does it hurt? She asked, mock concern on her face. You know, the scars? Beatrice gestured to her neck and let her hand fall to the brilliant necklace draping her chest. Mary saw the reason why she did it. To showcase her wealth and drive another nail into her station as a higher-born noble. Mary's hand crept up, and then she remembered her mother's, Lady Beaufort, she corrected herself, words. Sometimes, she found herself saying, It hurts when I swallow which was true. 
the burning hadn't faded away. Oh, you poor thing. And to think your father... I'm sorry, I, I shouldn't have said that. It's a silly rumor. I'm sure your father had nothing to do with your... accident. Mary glanced sidelong at Beatrice as they moved across the floor toward the back of the room. Beatrice gasped. He did. Mary shook her head. To be honest, she didn't know anything about her father. Elizabeth's father. It was becoming harder to separate herself while in the VR. Everything was so real. But she didn't know. That was why she was here. And if what Beatrice was saying had any semblance of truth, it was worth discovering. No. She looked at the roof of her mouth, trying to find the right way to ask the question. Mary settled on a partial truth. I, I don't really remember how it happened. No one will tell me. The lie just unfolded, and she committed to it. However, I would very much like to know what you have heard. You understand, of course. My father's reputation would demand a furious defense. For once, Beatrice's fake smile fell. But only for a second, as the girls behind her hissed. Let's not discuss such nastiness. Not when tonight is for merriment. We have games to play, and we want you to enjoy them with us. She lowered her voice to a conspiratorial whisper. Have you heard of the Mirror Mirror game? It's supposed to show you your ideal match. I just know I will see Harry. She blushed, and the girls behind her gusted. A small spike of jealousy invaded Mary's mind. At the corner of the church, partially obstructed by a few ladies coming up the stairs, was an arched doorway. The ladies whispered and laughed to themselves as they passed through. Many caught the name of some lord before the girls vanished into the crowd. Another group of girls entered the stairs and descended into the torchlight hanging on the wall. There's no need for Martha to go, Beatrice said, taking hold of the girl's hand to marvel at the ring on her finger. Mary had never seen a bigger diamond. She and James are to be wed next summer at Grantham Manor. It will be quite the spectacle, gushed Martha. Everyone is coming, even the... Not now, Martha, Beatrice cut in, rolling her eyes. You tell everyone who will listen. Elizabeth doesn't want to be bored to death about your wedding. Mary wondered if Elizabeth had been invited, then settled on a resounding no. Let Hannah go first. I have a good feeling you will find your true love tonight, she said in a sing-song voice. Hannah, taking her cue, pushed past the girls exiting the arched doorway. They looked back at her with a glaring expression and tossed their heads and left. Hannah didn't look back as she went down. Mary watched her straight back descend. The room was a cacophony of voices and music. It whirled around them as they waited. But something else grated on Mary's ears. The room wavered, like a static blur that passed over everything and then cleared. She felt a presence on her arm, a grip somewhere just above her wrist on her right hand. Then it vanished. Before her thoughts swam with why she had felt the touch, Hannah came back smiling. She stopped before them, but didn't breathe a word. Well, Beatrice asked, what did you see? Did you see a skeleton? You know that means you'll die alone. Mary couldn't believe how spiteful the girl was, and to her so-called friends. No, I didn't see a skeleton. I saw James. She smugly smiled at her sister. If there was one thing Elizabeth knew, it was when a fight was about to break out. All at once, the sisters exploded, and Beatrice watched with satisfaction. You did not see James. Take it back, hissed Martha. I will not take it back. The mirror showed James and I at the altar. He and I are soulmates. You were just... just what? fumed Martha. A cash cow. That is what you are. Father should have betrothed me, not you. Beatrice left them arguing and linked Mary's arms in hers. Silly girls. She shook her head and pulled Mary to the door. Let's do this together, shall we? Between you and me, she said, looking around. I'm scared of the dark. You wouldn't tell anyone, would you? Mary felt herself shrink with compassion. For once, she believed Beatrice was actually being honest. And if she was honest, the thought of descending into the unknown depths of this church set a pang of flutters into her stomach. But she had to know. She had to know that Harry and herself would be together despite her father. 
Despite the rest of them. Despite her... I'm a little afraid, too. Elizabeth smiled and tugged Beatrice's arm tightly. Together? Together, Beatrice smiled. She wasn't sure how it had happened, or if her mother was wrong. Beatrice wasn't the nightmare she had told her she was. Elizabeth saw behind it all. The facade of strength. The prowess of power. A lady of her stature needed to be seen as a prize for a prince or lord, and she felt sorry for her. How much pressure she must be under was unthinkable. And she was confiding in her, and not the sisters who were at each other's throats for the same man. The doorway and stairs were wide enough for them to walk to a breath. The smoke from the fire smelt stronger here, even though the holes in the walls took most of it away. A cold settled around them. One of time and stone. A stale cold, full of the spice of lichen and the tang of mold. After twenty and a score of steps, Elizabeth and Beatrice landed on the crypt floor. Twenty paces before them, in an alcoved corridor barely tall enough to stand upright, was a mirror. The wood around it was hand-carved in flowers and vines and stained in a deep red. The merriment above them echoed down. The music and chatter combined sounded eerie. Elizabeth found herself squeezing her friend's arm tighter. This is spooky. I don't... Elizabeth swallowed past the burning in her throat. The air was thicker in the crypt, and the added scent of the room tickled her throat. I don't want to do this, Elizabeth croaked. Don't be silly, it's right there. Look, I'll go first. Elizabeth felt the reluctance of Beatrice as her arm left hers. The mirror before them didn't reflect anything but black. It was like the mirror showed another world. A pit to hell. Elizabeth watched as the girl approached the mirror, but before she took the last step to stand directly in front of it, she whirled around and hurried back. Well? Elizabeth asked. The anticipation was too much. Who did you see? A chill sprung up as the girl's locked eyes. Beatrice's once rosy complexion paled. She wasn't sure if it was the cold, the room, or what she had seen, but Elizabeth needed to know. She needed to know that Beatrice hadn't seen Harry. She couldn't live with that. Not Harry. He and her had begun courting last summer. It was only her father's expedition to capture his monster that had halted their progress. They were both devastated when Lord Ainsley had forbidden their courtship because of it. But who could stand in the way of true love? Beatrice faced Elizabeth and grasped her hands, forcing her to look into her eyes. I'll make a pact with you. When you look in that mirror, return back to me and we will say the name of the person we saw together. Agreed? Elizabeth shrank a little more. A pact? With Beatrice Hamley? It was like she was being accepted. That she, Elizabeth, was now welcome in society. She tugged a little at the girl's smooth hands and nodded. Agreed. Elizabeth turned, smoothed down her dress, and sucked in a deep breath. The room was eerily quiet. If one got lost down here, no one would hear their cries for help. Each step echoed with anticipation. A slow clip of dread piercing the silence. The walls seemed to close in around her as the mirror took up the space in front. It was like a gateway, a burgundy guardian of Providence. The next step, Elizabeth saw her face. Next, her shoulders and dark dress. The high neckline of her collar. Then, the drape of fabric surrounding her legs. She was beautiful in a basic way. High cheekbones, light green eyes that still shone in the darkness tight black hair without a strand out of place. The dress hugged her figure in the right places and would fan out if twirled on the dance floor when Harry asked her to dance. She stopped and stared at herself. A mixture of curiosity and contempt. Her skin held a pallor of green. A sickly twist of her once perfect skin. For the life of her, she couldn't remember anything past the carriage ride here. And when she did try... All that sprung up was a feeling of dread. She felt a presence surrounding her as she looked behind her reflection. But she saw nothing aside from herself. Beatrice stayed back close to the stairs. 
For once, Elizabeth saw her for what she was, a scared little girl. The mirror shimmered. Ice crept in from the sides, and Elizabeth gasped. What is it? What did you see? called Beatrice, in a voice that bordered on fight and flight. Elizabeth peered closer as the ice ringed her reflection. She felt the press of weight on her arm and looked down at her wrist. Her hands were free. Nothing was there. She brought them up, turned them over so her reflection mimicked her. The pressure moved to her shoulder, a tip-tap of fingers walking the space between her shoulder blades, up to her collarbone and over her neck. Her hand went there instinctively. Her reflection copied her perfectly as only a mirror could. But there was something else there. In the blur of glass and darkness, four long strips of bony white. The tip-tap of fingers crossed over her other shoulder, and when she looked, another four long, bony white fingers grasped her reflection shoulder. She gasped again, as the face behind her held her stare in its fathomless eyes. What is it? Tell me what you see. Elizabeth, shaken by death's appearance and Beatrice's pleading squeal, shook off the vision and turned away. A coldness, the like of something she had never felt before, weighed heavily on her soul. No, that's not right, she thought. She had felt this before. Once. But she could not place why or when. Beatrice tugged at her arm and forced her around to face her. Well, tell me, what did you see? The scared little girl was gone. Beatrice's cheeks were the ruddy red of peaking anger. Harry, I, I saw Harry, she lied. The thought of not finding happiness without him scared her to no end. So what if she did really see Harry? They were in love, and nothing anyone could say would stop that. Not even a silly game on Halloween. Beatrice pulled back. Arms rigidly straight at her side, chin held high and lips quivering. You're lying. No, no, I didn't. It's the truth. Elizabeth swallowed past the uneasiness she felt. Death was still in the room. You are a liar, Elizabeth before. I saw Harry. He's mine. Do you hear me? Mine. You can't give him what he needs. Only I can. You're a freak. I won't stand for it. The dread in Elizabeth's chest burnt away. She narrowed her eyes at the whining girl before her. You don't know, do you? She said, enjoying the way the girl's face fell. You don't know? Elizabeth gasped and then grinned. Know what? demanded Beatrice. That Harry and I have been courting for the last six months. He's going to ask my father for my hand when he gets back from his expedition. You're lying, Beatrice sneered. Her hands clenched and unclenched at her side. Her ruddy cheeks were now a fiery rash across her face. Elizabeth enjoyed the moment. She waltzed around Beatrice as if she were a mouse, and she were a tiger. I am not lying, and you know it. Beatrice came at her with a feral growl, and she wasn't ready. Elizabeth stumbled back as Beatrice pushed her. She tried to swing her arms out to grab anything, but the wall slipped out of her fingers. The mirror sailed by in a flash of glass. The next moment, something hit her heel and sent her flying backwards. When she glanced to see what had caused her to fall, she saw bricks lined up beside the door. The dust billowed up from the cupboard like a cloud of retribution and standing in its midst like a spectral god was Beatrice. Before Elizabeth could right herself, she swung the heavy door closed. She heard the fall of a latch, then the sliding of a bolt, and the scrap of bricks. Hey, let me out! She tried to shout, but all that came out was a hoarse croak. She banged on the door, sending more dust into the air. Each breath pulled it in and made her cough until she was bent double. Harry is mine, Elizabeth. I am not sorry about doing this. Beatrice's voice grew quieter as she moved away from the door. You're a freak. A monster. He can never love you. Let me out, Beatrice croaked again, and then fell silent realizing that there was nobody in that room outside her prison. Elizabeth sat breathing heavily. Time spun on as she fought with what was happening. The distant hum of music slowed. 
This isn't happening. This isn't right. Think, Elizabeth, think. Slowly, a thought crept up on her. The thought of being buried alive down here where no one would find her. It's not real, she gasped. Remembering it wasn't Elizabeth sitting in a cupboard, but Mary. Her real self sitting in the crypt with Clerval standing beside her. The pressure she had felt on her arms and shoulders wasn't death. It was him. Desperately, she fought to take off the glasses, but her fingers slid over her smooth skin. Help me, she screamed, her throat burning, her chest heaving. Each time she reached up, her fingers slid away. Nothing was working. She couldn't get out of the experience. She sat back again, cradling her head in her hands as hot tears ran down her cheeks. She wiped them away and looked at the glistening sheen of tears running over her hand. Clerval's voice echoed in her mind. Just pinch the skin between your thumb and forefinger on your left hand and the system will disengage. Mary reached for the spot and pinched hard enough to enlist a painful scream. The world fell away like water running over an ink painting. Her world faded back in. The museum, the exhibit, Clerval. He stood before her expectantly, running his thumb and forefinger together like he was watching a cockfight. Well, what do you think? Clerval asked with a hint of impatience. With shaking hands, Mary handed him the nodes and glasses. It's marvelous and visceral. I felt like I was there with her every step of the way. Mary massaged her temples, trying to separate the virtual world from hers. She felt it linger in her mind, in her body, like she was coming out of a bad trip. Yes, quite the tragic tale, I'm afraid. Things definitely shook out differently back then. Quite the achievement of modern technology, I must say. So then, Mary, do we have a deal? Shall we embark on this new venture together? As partners? His words hung in the air as he put the mystical device away. The suitcase clicked shut, and she found herself lingering on the suitcase. She thought of Elizabeth and the mirror, the encroaching darkness when Beatrice locked her in there, and her screams as the simulation ended. Mr. Clerval, please call me James. Fine, James. I refuse. I can't, I won't take part in this exploitation, she said. Clerval's souring was immediate. I beg your pardon? Don't get me wrong. What you have shown me, it's incredible. Life-changing. But I can't, I can't turn all the work we've done here into some attraction. Some cash cow, Mary said, standing, her prosthetic feeling like a sudden dead weight. Despite the impairment, she stood up to him. I beg you to reconsider. This experience will change the world. And we will be the tip of the spear. No amount of bookworming, forensic digging, or anatomy class will tell us otherwise. This is the future, Mary. Lest you forget, I already have what I need. His retort hit like a slap to the face. I'll have you know, I spent years devoting my life to this. This isn't some payday for me. And I don't need some striking fellow to sweep me off my feet and tell me what's best for me. And if you think I'd just roll over like some scab and let you take everything from me, you're sorely mistaken. Mary was getting loud, her voice echoing throughout the exhibit. The glass case containing Elizabeth stood silently in the background, the petrified remains watching as things heated up. Clerval ran his hands through his hair, collected himself, and backpedaled. Mary was exhausted, leaning heavily on her good leg. Look, Clerval sighed, composing himself. The well has dried up, Mary. I know it. You know it. It's only a matter of time. I've spoken to the banks. You're on borrowed time. And once that's over, you're done. I understand your stake in this, and admirable as it is, I can't ignore the facts here. I have the funding. It doesn't have to end here. 
but it's going to one way or the other. I'd rather take you along on this journey than leave you in the dust. I could use your expertise in the field. There's no one better than you to lead this project. If you'd humor me and take the time to consider... Look, take the glasses. Go back in again. If you still feel the same way in the morning, so be it. Just give it a chance. Don't let go of the rope, Mary. Clerval held the suitcase out like an offering. Mary looked at it for a time, before tossing a glance at Elizabeth in the glass case. It didn't matter how many hours of digging or research she did. This would be the closest she would ever get. She chewed her lips so hard it drew blood. Fine, I'll give it another chance. Don't hold your breath, Mary said defiantly, taking the case. Clerval was already walking away, smoothing out his suit for his next endeavor. Wonderful. If by chance you change your mind, feel free to call. I'm staying in town for the night until the deal is done. I look forward to hearing from you, he said, leaving his business card on the table before he departed. Mary was left alone in the study, clutching the suitcase to her chest. She looked at her now useless journal of notes, blood and sweat from the past few years, to the glass case containing Elizabeth. Once home, Mary ran a bath and uncorked a bottle of wine, something special she had accrued during her travels abroad. After long years of storage, it felt right dusting it off, considering her union with the Lady of All Hollows, or ally as she'd come to know her. The first glass went down smooth, a remedy to the fatigue of her eventful day. The second, and the one that followed, was anxiously sipped through her contemplation of the multi-million dollar device. Even though the suitcase sat by the door, Mary couldn't help but think about it. Years of digging, professional consultation, seeking funding, only to repeat the process annually to fuel the search behind what had proven to be Elizabeth's existence. The thought of a decade's worth of excavation and chiseling having been proved futile by five minutes with a handsome man and some fancy tech felt sickening. But still, Mary found herself thinking of the suitcase at the door, and the insight it would provide if she put it on one more time. A lifetime. Two lifetimes worth of forensic analysis and studying, brought before her very eyes in a matter of seconds. Mary climbed out of the tub and toweled off taking the bottle with her as she went to her bedroom. After pulling on a warm, fluffy robe and polishing off the bottle, she soon found herself reapplying the nodes and holding the glasses in hand. She decided a fainting chair in the living room would do the trick. Mary looked at the glasses for a time before putting them on. Using the device one more time wouldn't hurt, even if she was still going to refuse Clairval's offer. Mary's world melted away into a jarring kaleidoscope of colors, shifting and twisting before her as she felt the weight of her body fade away. The scenes before her were erratic, unlike the smooth sink into the ballroom like the previous one. There was no party, no tight-fitting dress, no crowds of snobby folk. When she realized she couldn't move at all, that's when she heard the screams. Not her own, but Elizabeth's. She could feel the taut leather of restraints on her skin, and the swimming feeling in her eyes when she tried to make sense of the things around her. She could hear things. Terrible things. And she could only ride along as she saw what Elizabeth experienced. Felt what she felt. The simulation quickly grew from suffocating to horrifying, and soon she found herself unable to breathe or concentrate. A snap of lightning arcing across coils the rattling of chains and turning of wheels against the flickering candlelight, the boiling vats of amniotic fluid, and the noxious steam from colorful chemicals bubbling in vials. The knife as it cut down her neck, her chest, her abdomen. She screamed. Elizabeth screamed, helpless and trapped as her shattered brain fought to make sense of the trepidation. Bones broke. Skin was stretched and stitched and nodes electrified across her body, making her limbs involuntarily seize. Just as the nightmares started to mount, it faded away. A darkness that was soothing at first. Then eerie. Then claustrophobic. 
only the slightest of light had worked its way in. And, from what Mary could see, she was in the same corridor again, where Beatrice had left her. But it had been some time since then. Let me out. Let me out of here, please. The voice that spoke was tortured and hoarse, long-blown vocal cords struggling and desperate. Elizabeth had tried everything, throwing her weight against the wood that trapped her, kicking and screaming for someone to notice and save her. When a voice finally came, it offered no such salvation. Terribly sorry, Elizabeth. It's nothing personal. We're just doing what we have to so we can survive. You're a freak. Better you than one of us, is all. We all know the murderous spree your father's monster wreaked. We will not let another Frankenstein loose in London. The knocking on the other side of the door was consistent and loud, deafening Elizabeth in the dark as she struggled. At first she thought someone had come to rescue her, but when the knocks got progressively higher, she realized they were bricks. They were sealing her in. You can't do this to me. Please, I'll do whatever you want. Elizabeth wailed on the other side, but there was no hope. You're already doing plenty. Even through the wall, the voice was familiar. An assertive and arrogant tone that talked to her like she was a rat scurrying by his shoe. Baron Clerval. And then the voice was gone, replaced by the steady stacking of brick atop mortar. Mary felt Elizabeth's mind break, and the realization made her sick to her stomach. She could only listen to the woman scream and plead, their voices melding together in a joined agony in the dark. She clawed at the walls, fingernails scratched until they broke, and the digits filed away against the blood-soaked wood until they were sharpened claws. Elizabeth screamed until her voice withered away, leaving behind nothing but a rasping groan as she pounded against her confinement. Even as her energy fled and she could do nothing but sob and rock herself on the floor, the voices of the past continued to haunt her, and the laughter of the living made sure to remind her of her solitude with every passing party. Starved, thirsty, and broken, Elizabeth wasted away, having no choice but to listen to her superstitious peers flourish. And still, she would not die. At the end of the darkness, the mirror called to Elizabeth. A single voice speaking one word that had no real meaning to Elizabeth. But still, she went to it, weakly. Mary watched through her adjusted eyes as she shambled to the mirror that seemed to glow. A light of mercy in her dark hell. When she was close enough to see, she heard it again. Ally? Through Elizabeth's eyes, Mary saw herself in the mirror. She was there on the other side, looking in with her hand on the glass. There were no VR glasses, no nodes, no chair. The Mary in the mirror looked innocent and curious. Elizabeth placed her hands on the glass, and for the first time in days, weeks, months, she felt hope. A hope woven with hatred and desperation. Without a word, Elizabeth lashed out of the mirror, shattering the glass with her bony claws and reaching for the person behind it with a shriek. When the shards fell away, the Mary on the other side was a spitting image of herself, garbed in the same bathrobe and glasses, the many nodes on her neck. The sight of it confused Elizabeth, and the confusion turned to rage. Just pinch the skin between your thumb and forefinger on your left hand, and the system will disengage. Mary reached for her left hand, and Elizabeth snatched it up. The twist was violent and quick, and Mary could hear herself yelp in pain beyond the simulation. She had to do something, anything, and quickly. Elizabeth tore at her robe, shrieking as she ripped off the sash and went for her gut. The claws tore through Mary like paper and dug quickly rooting around to extinguish whatever life had mysteriously come through the mirror that had cursed her. Mary watched from both sets of eyes, one watching helplessly as her insides spilled, while the other raked her repeatedly. Elizabeth reached with a bloody hand and grabbed Mary by the face, 
breaking the glasses against her temple and scraping one of the nodes free. The world started to distort. A cultivation of static and screams and pain that started to consume Mary in a whirlwind of mindless, violent misconstrue. Between your thumb and forefinger. With Elizabeth crushing her skull, Mary raised her left hand to her mouth and bit down as hard as she could. Just as the taste of blood touched her tongue, everything went black. Mary sat up in the fainting chair, pulling the glasses off and swatting herself like she was covered in spiders. She pulled the nodes free as fast as she could and collapsed into the chair, her chest heaving as she caught her breath. As the world spun around her, her eyes fell onto her belly and her hand. She touched her face feeling the trickle of tears as everything fell completely still. Her fingers and stomach were intact. The damage had just been part of the simulation. She lay there for a while, watching the ceiling fan spin as the pieces fell back together in her mind. Aside from the ringing in her ears and the sick feeling in her stomach, she was okay. Everything was going to be all right. Silently, Mary sat up, gathered the equipment, and looked at the telephone. Clerval had just finished pouring a double bourbon on rocks when the phone rang. He grabbed his glass and took his time fetching it, swaying leisurely with each relaxed step. Looking down at the mobile phone, he chuckled to himself before picking it up and holding it to his ear. James Clerval, he answered. I would like to speak to you as soon as possible. The woman on the line was a perfect mixture of eager and intense. Mary, my dear, I knew you'd come around. Clerval smiled, tilting the glass to his lips. I'm in. There's just some things I'd like to discuss. About things going forward, Mary said. From the sound of her voice, he could tell she was pacing. Of course, well, I just poured a drink. How would you feel about meeting me here, and I could pour you one as well? He said smoothly, smiling wider. Mary considered for a moment, but relented. That sounds delightful. Just let me swing by the exhibit. There's some things I need to grab first. Wonderful. I'm at the Four Seasons on Trinity Square. The Grand Heritage Suite. Uh, take your time. I plan on being up late. Clerval ended the call, and set the phone back on the end table. He downed the rest of his drink in celebration. Going to pour himself another, he laughed to himself. As smart and independent as Mary was, she was just as gullible as the rest. When Mary knocked on the door, Clerval answered immediately. She could tell he was already a few drinks in. He had a light sway to him, and his previous ice-cold demeanor had softened to a more friendly smile. The hotel was nice. Nicer than anything she had ever been in. And when he closed the door behind her, she couldn't help but feel like she was out of her element. He motioned for her to follow, leading the way down an illustrious hallway to a lounge room that looked like it belonged in a penthouse. She limped after him, her steps uneven and slow over the embroidered carpet. After a few strides, he took notice of it. Nasty limp you have there. Is everything all right? Shall we... It's fine. Don't worry about it. It's nothing, she said plainly, cutting him off. Of course. Shall we get a drink? Uh, we have scotch, gin. Champagne would be nice, Mary smiled. Very well. I suppose this does call for a little celebration. Clerval headed back to the bar in the lounge room, selected something expensive-looking that had been on ice, and popped the cork. He poured a glass for both of them and sank into the sofa, patting the seat next to him. Mind joining me? Been standing all day. My feet are killing me, he said, leaning back. Mary nodded and sat next to him, watching him as she settled in. He looked handsome with his loosened tie and untucked shirt, and she couldn't help but smile a little herself. Well, how does it feel? he asked after an awkward silence. What's that? Mary asked, sipping her champagne. To make the first contact. Nobody's done the simulation before. You're the very first. And I must say, the data we've collected is fantastic, Clerval said, leaning closer. 
He smelt a bourbon, an aftershave. What do you mean, first? You said it was ready to be available to the public. You, you'd run tests. Well, sure, we ran tests with an AI to ensure the simulation could handle the workload. And it did, flawlessly. But you were the first human to actually dive in. And now we have all we need. Huh. Imagine that, Mary said. Her leg felt stiff. The skin, where the nodes had been, felt sensitive and itched her annoyingly. Her mind felt heavy. Look, no great thing has come without sacrifice. You've accomplished very important things today. Work that will change the world for decades to come. This is the future, and you are at the head of the ship. This will be very profitable for both of us, Clerval said, placing a hand on her thigh. He traced a finger around the lace of her dress, letting it linger as he downed his drink. Actually, do you mind if I use the bathroom? I, I just need to freshen up, Mary said, scooting away. Of course, dear, it's just over there. Past the bar, Clerval said, pointing to the corner of the room. Thank you, excuse me. Mary leaned against the sink, staring into the water as it swirled in the basin. She felt like she couldn't breathe. She took a deep breath and looked at her hair in the mirror. The blue ribbon in her hair felt too tight. Her dress felt too tight. Every fiber of her being felt compressed. Most of all, her head. She watched her reflection as she reached up and tugged at the ribbon, letting it fall as she shook her hair out. Outside the bathroom, she heard a hushed voice and she tried to listen in. She slowly turned the knob on the water until the stream ceased and crept to the door to listen. Clerval was speaking to someone, on his phone from the sounds of it. I know, I know, yes, I know. But once this is over and we have what we need, we're in mint condition. We'll just scrub her out, nobody will know the difference. I know, get the lawyers. Yes, of course. We'll talk more tomorrow, she's here now. I'll let you know when she's left. Mary pulled away from the door and went back to the sink. Gravity felt like it was crushing her. She turned the tap back on and splashed some water on her face, once, twice. She massaged the water into her eyes, her temples. When she turned the water off, she shook the droplets from her hands and looked at the mirror. Elizabeth was there, watching. Not the same Elizabeth from the corridor or the mirror, but one that was immaculate and profound. Her eyes were vibrant blue and caring, her golden hair worn like a crown. Every imperfection from the last simulation was gone. It was like she had stepped right out of a picture book. Elizabeth's once violent and distressed demeanor had changed to one of understanding, and she peered upon Mary with a look of motherly kinship. There was a glimmer of tears in her eyes, and with a slow, elegant gesture, she placed her hand on the other side of the mirror. Mary looked upon Elizabeth with awe. The buzzing in her brain seemed to fade, and she felt the lure to the mirror like a warm embrace. Amidst the whirlwind of cold betrayal, screams, and suffering, a common ground had been found. The unspoken pact was formed, and Mary placed her hand on the mirror, matching Elizabeth's. A tear fell, and Elizabeth nodded. Mary returned it, before her eyes fell to the blue ribbon that lay in a pile at her feet. Yes, ally. Tess shoved through the doors of the museum, listening to the dial tone drum in her ear. Weaving through the morning crowd, she hurried down the halls that led to her exhibit, as she searched her purse for the key. When she arrived at the door, the dial tone timed out, and she heard the cheery voicemail recording she'd heard a hundred times before. Of course, of all times, she wasn't answering. Mary, you need to call me back as soon as possible. Something's happened, something bad. It's all over the news and things are a mess. There's been a murder. I'm at the exhibit now and I'll be waiting here until you get here. Call me back, please. Tess sighed and hung up the phone. She grabbed the key and readied it. But when she looked through the window of the door, she could see the lights were on. When she tried the knob, she found it unlocked. Tess let herself in, pushing the door open slowly before poking her head in. It had always, always been locked up at night. Something Mary had instilled in her through her own paranoia and guardianship over the Lady of All Hollows. 
she saw the blood first. A drip-drop pattern that led from the door all the way to the case they had fought so hard to protect. The dressings came next. Stained bandages that were soaked with crimson in a wildly discarded fashion, along with a twine and needle set. Tess followed the trail slowly, her heels clicking with every hesitant step. She walked until she reached the display case, her heels crunching over shards until she found a hammer on the floor, next to a handsaw, and the blood that enveloped them both. The display case had been destroyed, the immaculate specimen still standing as it had been left the day before. All except the left leg. That had been hacked off at the knee. Clairol watched the inches of bourbon coat the ice flawlessly. When it was satisfactory, he held the glass up to his nose to savor it, taking in the hints of aged oak before strolling from the bar to the main hall of the suite. Everything was falling into place. All he had to do was drink and schmooze until morning, possibly get a little extra before his meetings tomorrow. Now that all the pieces were together, he didn't see any harm in indulging in the local talent. He salivated at the thought, and raised the glass to quench himself. The sound of shattering glass was piercing, sobering. His fingers tightened around the glass as he stiffened, looking around with his mouth agape. Mary? Everything all right? His words felt heavy in the air, and his response was the uncanny stillness of the suite. Clerval sauntered into the lounging room, scanning with his drink in hand. There was no one in sight, only the stillness of the furniture around him. In the far corner, the bathroom door was left ajar, showing only a crack of darkness within. Did you cut yourself? Should I ring the hospital? He worked his way to the bathroom quickly, downing some of his drink before nudging the door open and flicking on the light. The stark white bathroom was blinding, but the mess rained Clerval's attention immediately. The mirror had been destroyed. Shards of glass littered across the tile. Blood was everywhere. Droplets scattered throughout the damage. He followed the trail, one that led across the desolated carpet back to the entrance. He tracked it to the front door, his drink sloshing as his attention drew nearer and nearer to the carpet itself. When he arrived at the door, it was closed, and he found himself perplexed. There were two trails of blood, one slightly less fresh than the other. Had she been bleeding from the moment she came in? Clerval rubbed his eyes, trying to narrow his focus. He'd been drinking for a time before she got there, and he couldn't recall anything particularly strange. But he hadn't heard the door open or close. And when he looked at the trail, he couldn't help but think it had turned around and went back into the suite. Like she hadn't left. Clerval craned his head. He heard footsteps on the carpet, growing quicker with each step, heading directly towards him. Mary? The woman who came up behind him resembled Mary in a roundabout way, although her hair was now lighter than it was, so was her skin. A tinge of green radiated off her like a toxic spill. High cheekbones held the hint of decay and decade-old bruises. Two other things caused the bourbon to churn in his gut. One, Mary's limp was more profound now, as she rocked toward him. The reason being was the stump of another's leg haphazardly sewn onto her own. And the other reached out toward his neck. Fingers worked down to the bloodied bone from years of scraping against hardwood. Mary? He tried again. Although his voice hitched up as she came forward with a lost look in her eye. Clairval, have you met Elizabeth before? Mary swooned, all of her grace gone now as the two melded together. Clairval backed away until the wall forced him to stop. Your ancestors knew me, spoke Elizabeth through their connection, her voice distorted and cracked. The mirror no longer held her bound. The VR experience had allowed her the freedom of Mary's mind allowed her to seek revenge from ages past. I don't know what you mean. Mary came forward, bloody fingers outstretched like starfish. 
Yes, you do. It was in the pages you tore out, remember? Clerval balked. How she knew he had torn out the pages of that tatty old diary was a mystery. They were safely hidden in his briefcase. The whole sordid ordeal. How his ancestor was the savior of London for putting away another monstrosity. Oh, you do remember. Mary's bloodied hand snapped out and caught him around the throat, her unnatural strength lifting him off the plush carpet. You sought to follow in his footsteps by reliving my tragedy. Uh, uh, tragedy. Clerval croaked. A triumph over a monster. And you wanted to showcase it over and over again. Mary squeezed with every word until Clerval gasped for air. As stars appeared in his eyes and his thoughts trailed to his demise, the pressure lifted. Mary set him down, but kept one hand on his throat. Men, she spat. Why do you always think you're better than us? Not anymore. With her free hand, she reached into the tatters of her dress and pulled out the VR nodes. You want your experience so badly? You can have it. Clerval's fight against her grip was futile. Her strength pinned him to the wall as she attached the nodes to his head. Then the glasses fell over his eyes and his sight went dark. The dull colors of the gray crypt washed around him. In front, gleaming softly in the baleful light, shimmered the glass of Elizabeth's prison. He reached out a hand and stopped as the bloody stump met his vision. No, this can't be. He gasped. But the more he looked, the more the realization of his situation set in. A voice floated into his ear from his other location. Here you will stay. Like I did for so long. But you will have no release. No body left to flee to. He heard the snap of his corporeal neck and the faint sound of his body falling to the Grand Suite's floor as his ears died to the deafness of the crypt. He heard Mary's feet leaving the room. Become a channel member today for early access, bonus videos, and special emojis only available to members. Check out the description below or click the join button for more info. If you'd like another way to help support the channel, please consider joining my Patreon page at patreon.com forward slash Jordan Group Horror. As a patron, you'll get access to bonus videos and content, You'll be credited at the end of every video going forward, and if you decide to stay for three months, I'll name a character after you which will be featured in a Hollow's End story. Links to join the Patreon are in the description. Thanks everyone for listening, please like, subscribe, and comment to help the channel continue to grow, and see you again next time at 4pm Eastern Standard Time. Hope you have a great night.